Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Frenemies. David, what's wrong, buddy? I haven't even got to the introduction. Background here, BJ. David, it's okay, man. And Blue Jays fans, it's okay. Don't, don't, you know, don't be upset about the fact that he has 58 career home runs versus the Blue Jays. It's all right. You Blue Jays fans can get over it. Uh, this is David's favorite player of all time. Um, the celebrity couple of him and J Lo. He dreams about every night. He keeps track of it. If you're if you're dumb enough to cheat on J Lo, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what to say right now. Uh, <laughs> so join wow. us always by David Swore. I am DJ Cox. Thanks for joining us tonight. And we have another special guest tonight, friend of the Frenemies podcast, Matt Kearns. It's awesome to have you again, buddy. Uh, you're like Thank the you, only man. Blue Jays fan we know. You're obviously a Reds fan, but you're like grew up loving the Blue Jays too. So, oh, Canada tonight, all you – well, I don't even know if they're Canadian anymore. Where are they? Buffalo, uh, Destin, Florida, or Fort Lauderdale. Where are they playing now, David? Dunedin, Florida, yeah. Never heard of it. That's a famous David line. Never heard of it. I have no idea where that is on the map, uh, but it's somewhere down in Florida. I'm sure it's a minor league uh, spring training field or something, and off they go, right? I mean, whatever. Tampa Bay area doesn't really draw too many fans, so I don't know. It's very interesting <laughs> that they're down there, but we are talking Blue Jays tonight. We are rolling along here on our 30 teams. <laughs> We're kind of struggling with opening day coming up here pretty quick. We're going to do our best, but we're excited to have you, Matt. And uh, we're going to talk some Blue Jays baseball. So, David, kick us off, man, with a 2020 recap. How were those Blue Jays in 2020? The Blue Jays took another step forward, DJ. They were kind of like everybody's darling. And I think they kind of are again this year. Uh, and so 32 and 28, third in the AL East. Eight seed in the playoffs. They got broomed by uh, the Rays 2-0. Uh, but overall, good season. Um, 12th in average. Uh, so they're a pretty good hitting team. Uh, fourth in homers. So they had some pop great seasons out of Teoscar Hernandez, who kind of came out of nowhere, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, he's been a pretty good player, but he was very good last year. 289, 16 homers, 34 RBIs. Randall Gritchett, 273, 12 homers, 35 RBIs. Who saw that coming? Uh, Lourdes Gurriel, 308, 11 homers, 33 RBIs. And, of course, Bo Bichette still uh, hitting well, 301, five homers, and 23 RBIs. But big problem, their pitching was terrible. Outside of uh, Ryu, who was awesome, as usual, 5-2, two, 269. And the late season uh, effort they got from Taiwan Walker was really good, but DJ, you just can't depend on guys like Robbie Ray and Tanner Roark uh, to get you to get you through the playoffs. And so that was their downfall all year. And we'll talk about it pretty soon. They really didn't do much to uh, to help with that either. So a uh, good year overall, 32 and 28. I think uh, first time they'd had a winning record in a while. So, um, and, you know, like I said, a lot of people think they're still knocking on the door. They made some great moves in the offseason, but good season. Matt, what'd you think of it, buddy? Yeah, I have to agree. Um, you know, these guys, if you look at, at, at these guys on paper, I mean, I, we're going to talk about fantasy in a little bit, but if you project these guys' stats out for a full season, you've got five to six legitimate studs. And you consider that Vlad didn't even really have what we would consider a good year, and he still was on pace to hit over 25 home runs and drive in almost 100 runs. So, to me, if, if these guys – uh uh, continue to, to make a step forward, like David said. They really remind me of a couple years ago how the Royals had that young nucleus of uh, Hosmer and Moustakas and Alex Gordon and Salvador Perez. This team reminds me exactly of that team where they have that core of young players that if they just throw some, some veteran leadership in there and some, some stable pitching, that, that they're going to win a World Series. Um, that's, the, that's who this team reminds me of. So yeah, to recap 2020, I think it was a successful year for them because they did step forward. They made the playoffs. Obviously, they didn't do well in the playoffs, but, you know, making the playoffs in that division is, is a step forward, in my opinion. Yeah. But guys, let's talk about Vlad here real quick. Um, you know, he 
he came into the league like with a ton of hype. I mean, everybody was picking him up in those fantasy drafts pretty early. But has he been a disappointment or I don't know? Or is it unfair to say that at this point? I, I can't figure out what to think about Vlad. Well, I kind of think that Vladdy's still so young and we're kind of rushing these guys a little bit. I mean, I get he's the most hyped prospect we've had in a long time. And he's a son of a Hall of Famer, which so is BGO. You know, these guys are really hyped up big time. Um, and to be honest with you, David, he was doing all this in horrible shape. Like, you just look at him and, like, how is this guy, you know, managing to survive on a baseball field in the kind of shape he's in? And I told you last year they were going down to the Dominican just to check on him to make sure he wasn't eating himself out of the league, to be honest with you. They were sending people down there just to check on him. And so this offseason, to his credit, I believe he dropped 40 pounds and uh, he's ready to go. He's in a lot better shape now. Uh, he needed to do that. He really did. Let's just be honest. I think that that's going to help him a ton. He's very talented. Um, I don't know about his defense very well. We'll see about that. That's to be determined. But really, to be honest with you, all they need him to do is just mash and be the RBI guy in that lineup. So I can see where you're kind of saying, you know, he, he's really hyped and maybe you know, you would expect a little bit more out of him out of the gate, but I think he's going to get there. And I really think he's an absolute stud. What do you think, Kearns? Well, I think it's just been a small sample size. I'm going here. I just pulled up his stats while we were talking here. I mean, he's only had, um, let's say, 685 at-bats. And so in the 685 at-bats, he's got 24 home runs and 102 RBI. If, if we were talking about, maybe somebody that wasn't as highly touted, we would say this guy is, is a promising future all-star based on those statistics. And he's even batting, you know, 269 is, is, is his career batting average. So to me, he's not reached his potential yet. I do think, like you said, some of the, the physical attributes, you know, being overweight and kind of not been in, in good shape probably uh, hurt him. And he's probably gotten by on talent most of his life. And so that's not been a big deal. And now he's, he's kind of in the big leagues and he's playing with the big boys and things are going to be different. So it will be interesting to see if he makes that next step to superstar or is he going to be just, you know, one of those run-of-the-mill guys that, you know, that we see quite a bit of, honestly, that come up highly touted that don't develop into anything. Uh, I don't think, personally, I don't think that's what he's going to be. I think he's going to, I think he will have, an excellent career. I do too. I agree with you. I think he's headed for great things and I think he's going to be the face of the franchise when it's all said and done. Uh, so yeah, man, the 2020 blue Jays totally uh, got a piece of the playoff pie. We talked about this before last season, how uh, if they made the playoffs, it would be an awesome year for them. They did that. They gave these young guys a taste of that. I'm sure they loved it. It made them more hungry for this season coming in. And uh, they're ready to go, man. This team is legit. So everybody in their lineup last year had between 20 and 35 ribbies, except for Travis Shaw. Uh, and then they sent him to the Brewers because he didn't make the 20 club. So he's gone already. <laughs> Bo Bichette hit 301, like you said. Nate Pearson made his much anticipated debut for the, uh, for the rotation there. But four starters, uh, four starters, man, they, they struggled a lot. Like you said, besides Ryu, uh, they really mightily struggled, and um, that's not good when you got four starters who are kind of weak, weak links in that whole rotation. The Blue Jays were eight and two versus the Orioles, four and six, uh, and zero oh and two in the playoffs for versus the Rays, which makes a four and eight record versus the Rays, who was their nemesis last year, and obviously knocked them out of the playoffs. Um, they were seventeen and nine at home, and fifteen and nineteen on the road. So that was a kind of a weird stat that they were so good at home playing in New York last year uh, and, and just kind of weird how that worked out for them. So I don't know. I guess that means that they should just get out of Canada and come to the America then, right? Isn't that how that kind of works? Just go ahead and really come down. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, Toronto's already got the Maple Leafs for hockey, and they're like the best team in the world, so they don't need a baseball team. So for what? Send, send them down to – Send them down to Destin or wherever they're at right now. I don't even know what the heck they're for, at. So. For hockey? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so we're going to transition here now to the key additions, David, that Ross Atkins has made this offseason for this team. And here we go, man. I'm telling you, I'm excited about this team. 
Uh, I still think they got a little ways to go, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but um, he did a great job of adding to that offense. And I thought he was going to do it a little different here. I thought he was going to start pecking away at that rotation a little bit, but he's going offense first, which has been successful for the Astros and the Cubs in recent years. So I get it. If you load up your offense and then you build the pitching off of free agents, he's going to be successful. He's on the right path. I like it. So George Springer from the Astros, uh, from 2014 to 2020, 174 homers, 458 ribbies. He batted 270 for his career with a 361 on base. He's the key guy they added, in my opinion, out of all the guys. I've already said him. Uh, it's George Springer. What a great addition to throw in the middle of that outfield. Awesome move on their part. He's exactly what they needed, I thought. Marcus Simeon, the sneaky. He's going to play second for him. They got him from the A's. Uh, Steven Matz, not really a fan, but they picked him up from the Mets. Tyler Chatwood is a great guy to have come out of the pen uh, for long relief. Got him from the Cubs. David Phelps from the Phillies. Francisco Liriano also from the Phillies. Kirby Yates from the Padres. Tyler White and Tommy Malone from the Braves. So, David, what do you think of the offseason additions? Uh, I'm going to give him a B on the offseason edition. But, guys, how bad did they need Trevor Bauer? That was the that was the signing that I kept waiting on to drop. And maybe Bauer just didn't want to go there. Um, but I love the George Springer signing. I'm a little meh on the Marcus Simeon uh, signing. I, I'm not a hater or anything, but they're paying him $17 million this year. And that just seems a little steep to me uh, for Simeon. Um, they did fortify the bullpen, but we've already got a problem in Toronto. Kirby Yates is down and out and done. So uh, I, I'm not sure who they're going to close. I know they got some options there. I don't have the guy's name in front of me um, that's being talked about, but uh, uh, Romano, I believe, is his name. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out, but very good addition, especially with Springer. I love Springer, and that is exactly what this lineup needed. And they needed a center fielder. So kudos to them for uh, reaching out and, and, and getting him. What do you think, Kearns? Yeah, I mean, Springer's your obviously uh, your, your marquee signing there. But I do think that the additions that they made to the bullpen actually, uh, you know, strengthened that, that team. Obviously, like David said, they should have gone after a marquee starter to kind of solidify that rotation. But if you can't get one of those guys, the next best thing you can do is solidify the bullpen, in my opinion, which, is, you know, I feel like they did. Um, and I do think that, uh, that that Stephen Matt signing, even though he may not be, you know, a solid two or three guy, I mean, he's definitely an improvement on what they had last year. So that could turn out to be, um, you know, a good signing for him. You know, he's had some success in the past. He's had – you know, from my, my perspective, a kind of a streaky career where he's been good and been, been bad. So, I mean, that, if we get the good one, I mean, maybe, maybe it works out well for him. DJ, I would have even felt better if they just would have brought Taiwan Walker back even. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would have been nice to have a Trevor Bauer, but I really expected them to kind of dip in uh, even to that second-tier market a little bit. They, they obviously love him some Robbie Ray for whatever reason. Um, you know, they signed him right off the bat. Um, but I just would like to see them get one more guy. I'm not sure that you can trust Tanner Roark, Steven Matz to pitch in the AL East. I mean, that's, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah, I agree with you guys. That's very true. So the key losses on this team, Travis Shaw to the Brewers, Jonathan Villar to the Mets, Brandon Drury to the Mets, Derek Fisher, isn't he a basketball player? He goes to the Brewers, Anthony Alford to the Pirates, Caleb Joseph to the Mets, Daniel Vogelbach to the Brewers, Billy McKinney to the Brewers as well. Chase Anderson to the Phillies. Uh, Matt Schumacher to the Twins. Taiwan Walker to the Mets as well. Uh, Anthony Bass went to the Marlins. That was a little shot to the bullpen there. Uh, Wilmer Font is a free agent. Sean Yamaguchi to the Giants. Uh, Sean Reed Foley to the Mets. Mets picked these guys apart a little bit. Ken Giles to the Mariners. Um, Hector Perez to the Reds. And Brian Moran to the Rays. So they did lose some guys there. Uh, not too much, though. I think, like you said, you mentioned this, David, I think Taiwan Walker, out of all those guys, I believe would have helped them the most that uh, they lost there. Is that what you're agreeing with, David? Yeah, yeah they needed they needed Taiwan Walker back or some, someone like him. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. You know, I didn't understand why they let Bass go. Um, you had a pretty good season last year. I think he was their closure part of the season even. Um, 
And so I think that's going to hurt too, but I think Walker is going to hurt worse than the rest of them. Any of those guys going down there going to hurt them? Kearns, what do you think? No, I mean, the guys that you mentioned, you know, when you were going through the list, because honestly, I didn't get, I didn't look at that, and you were just mentioning the names, and I was just like, in, in the back of my mind, I'm going, okay, no big deal, no big deal. Yeah. Yeah, Taiwan Walker is the obvious short, sore thumb here. You know, they they had an issue with the rotation, and to let your, your second best pitcher last year go, I don't I don't understand it, but uh, you know, sometimes there's stuff that goes on, obviously we don't understand and know behind the scenes. But I, like David said, if it's, if not him, somebody like him is exactly what that team needed, and they just uh, didn't do anything there. I mean, personally, like David said with Simeon, like I would much rather have seen them just plug in a, a journeyman type guy at second and, and spend that money on a quality pitcher. I mean, that that would have drastically improved that team team's uh, you know, overall standing, in my opinion. But sometimes maybe that stuff doesn't work out. Like you said, maybe maybe guys didn't want to come to Toronto, but – I mean, if you're looking at that core of, of, of young players, I don't know why you wouldn't want to come to this team if it's just – unless it's just a matter of I don't want to be in Toronto. So That's very true. It's got to be a little hard to draw free agents to Toronto, just being honest. I mean, what's the draw there? I don't really know. I've never been there. Sorry, Toronto fans, but not really sure. Destination Toronto excites people beyond belief. Playing with three Hall of – well, two Hall of Fame famer sons and one stud son is – probably what draws you there so no doubt about that they got a lot of young talent that draws free agents in and it worked this offseason so I'm not completely off on this offseason I really think that he's getting there with this team I think it's very sneaky uh like I said with the way that the Astros and Cubs did it it's it's starting to build up here and uh like you said their their pitching is a little sus but we'll get to that as well here a little later so talk about this lineup David uh give us what the one through nine uh, is for the Blue Jays in 2021. Pretty fun lineup here. Here we go. Yeah, one of the deeper lineups in the league. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't realize how deep it was. So in center field, they're going to have George Springer, 265, 14 homers, 32 RBIs. Second base, Marcus Simeon, 223 last year with seven homers and 23 RBIs. Bo Bichette batting third at shortstop, 301, five homers, 23 RBIs. Right field, T. Oscar Hernandez, 289, 16 homers, 34 RBIs. Vlad Guerrero playing first, 262, nine homers, 33 RBIs. Lourdes Gurriel, left field, 308, 11 homers, 33 RBIs. Kevin Vigio, uh, 250 last year, eight homers, 28 RBIs. Rowdy Telez, uh had a good season last year, 283, eight homers, 23 RBIs. And then catching is Danny Jansen. Uh, he batted 183 last year, six homers. So, again, this is – one of the top lineups in the league, man. It's, it's going to be rough going through that. Uh, just looking at it from bird's eye view, um, I'm just trying to think down through here. It seems pretty right-handed, though. Um, is is Biggio a switch hitter? Anybody know? I'll look it up, but I don't know. Um... Um, yeah, so that, that's one thing that would concern me. Um, if I was a Blue Jays fan, I know Springer switch hits. Um, but it looks pretty right-handed to me. So that, that, like I said, that's one thing that would concern me, but, uh, overall, man, great lineup. I honestly, I didn't realize how good it was. If, if Simeon's back to MVP form, this is going to be a killer lineup. So we'll see if they can make that happen. Yeah. It says busy your batch left-handed. Bats left. Okay. So maybe they, they probably got a couple of lefties there that I was missing. Rowdy, I believe is a lefty too. So not, yeah, like you said, not too many of them there, but here's another thing, guys, like, Randall Gritchick is on your bench. Uh, this guy, 273 last year, 12 homers, 35 ribby, led the team in ribbies and is sitting the bench, a la David Bodie. What is going on with the guys <laughs> leading the league in rib the team in ribbies and sitting the bench the next year? What is going on? What am I missing? Uh, he needs to be your second round pick, DJ, right after Bodie. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be loaded. You'll have all the RBIs. Oh, it's crazy to me to think that there's two RBI champs on the team not even starting for their teams this year. I mean, this is a deep lineup, don't get me wrong, and I'm not really sure who you play him over, so I kind of get it. Uh, I guess Telez I would kind of look at a little bit and maybe Gritchick gets some at-bats there at DH or something like that. But I get it, man. This is a crazy lineup. It's really loaded with talent. 
Uh, Danny Jansen's kind of the weak link there offensively, but he's a really good catcher. So it makes sense. So I think it's, it's loaded. And, and I got a quick question for you. You can just answer this real quick. Um, who's the best player on this team? This is kind of an interesting question. Like if you, if you had to tell somebody like, you know, cause this is, this is interesting. Like who do you feel is the single best player on this team? What do you think, David? A really good question. I'm going to have a tough time going against Springer. Um, I yeah, think Springer kind of helped carry the Astros. And so based upon that, I'm going to say Springer. What do you think, Matt? I was actually going to go with Ryu just for the fact that he's probably, uh-huh. you know, without him, you know. But, I, I mean, yeah, I agree with David, too. Like, Springer is that guy that, you know, you've got a core nucleus of young guys that you can't really say one stands out above the other. And Springer kind of has that veteran leadership and proven track record that you can look at and say, this guy is is the man, and they can all kind of look up to him. And, um, you know, he's not that old either, but, you know, he can kind of be the mentor type to these guys. But, I mean, honestly, I think if you're looking at it from from a potential perspective, I think Vlad has the most potential. Um, but who's the best player? And, and there's kind of like <laughs> – I guess that's not a bad thing to have when you've got about seven or eight guys that are all kind of in line there with with very solid production. That's crazy, man. I was thinking about this a lot today. And to be honest with you, I don't even know if I have a for sure answer, man. These guys are just so much different types of potential here and so much types of talent and stars. And they're all, uh, you know, really good. So I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see who kind of breaks away and becomes like the the man at the plate, you know, so to speak, and, and the guy that can dominate every night. So, David, walk us through that rotation, bud. How are they going to hand up, handle up here on the mound this year uh, is kind of the question mark. So what do you think? This is where it gets really ugly because <laughs> now Nate Pearson is down. You know, he, he was kind of the hope of this rotation. Now, I haven't heard how long he's down, if that's a season-ending thing or what. But, man, that is a big, big, big blow to this rotation. So you got Ryu on the top. He's the man when he pitches. He's had a little bit of injury struggles in the past, but he's the man when he pitches. No doubt about it. But then after that, you've got Robbie Ray, who shows flashes of greatness, but uh, pretty few and far between. He struggles. Lots of walks. Tanner Roark, um, Kearns could probably tell us a little more about him, former Red. Uh, rough year last year. Steven Matz, you know, again, he's he's had flashes here and there, but 968 ERA last year, 0-5. And, and then right now penciled in at number five is Ross Scripling. And, again, a good pitcher out of the bullpen or a swing man, but guys, this just, this just isn't going to work. I hate to say that uh, for my Blue Jays fans, but, but, but this isn't going to work in the, uh, like I said, in, a, in, a, in the AL East. I mean, if you run that rotation out against the Yankees and you're going to have problems, you run that rotation out against, um, you know, a team like the Dodgers, you're going to have problems. Uh, and even the Rays, man, the Rays can still hit. I know they, they traded away some guys, but they can still hit. So, I don't, I don't know about this pitching staff. I just think the G, their GM really sold them short. This is a team that could have for sure competed uh, for the division if they just had a couple more pitchers. What do you think, Matt? Well, <clears throat> I'm not overly excited about the pitching staff, but I do think I have a better or a more optimistic outlook on it than David does. Um, you know, Robbie Ray obviously has had ups and downs, but, you know, he could pull it together again. Steven Matz to me, that's a guy that can solidify that rotation a little bit. He's not going to wow you or anything. And that's kind of the same thing with Tanner Rowe or he's not, he's just kind of a steady guy. There's an inning, they're innings eaters, but you know, the bullpen, in my opinion, I know we're talking about the starters, but the bullpen to me, I think maybe they're, maybe they're thinking like the Rays did a couple of years ago where they're only expecting these starters to, to go two or three innings and they're going to throw in a guy like Chatwood or Liriano, who, you know, former starters who can go and kind of bridge that gap to get to the back end of the bullpen. You know, I mean, honestly, you look at this, this lineup and is a guy with a five ERA going to kill you when you're scoring 10 runs a game with this lineup? I mean, maybe that's the way they're looking at it. I, I mean, obviously if you had a shutdown guy like a Trevor Bauer, you, you know, you would feel a whole lot better about this team, but you know, these guys to me are guys that are going to go out. They're going to pitch, four to five innings, maybe six if on a good night, and then you're going to hand the ball over to that to that bullpen and hope that they uh, they can close the door. 
Yeah, you know, this is an interesting rotation. I'm not completely sold on it, obviously. I'm not, like, as down on it, I, I guess, as I possibly should be. Pearson scares me if he's down. I don't know how long he's out either. Um, but that guy is legit, man. And if they had Ryu and him one and two, man, you're looking at a solid one, too. And then you got some guys that kind of piece it in there that have been there, got a lot of experience. So I don't think it's terrible. I think Steven Matz is. ERA is kind of off the charts there. I don't know how he managed to give up 9.68 for nine last year. That's just ridiculous. But um, he just seems to never have been really reached his potential. He had a couple of really good years there uh, for the Mets and then just kind of just was average at best from there and even bad at times. So um, they took a risk on him, which I get. You know, sometimes you take a risk on a guy like that who's got so much potential and then you guys got, like you said, Chatwood can fall back on. Chatwood's really good I believe uh at filling that role of being long reliever and spot starter he's excellent at that when he gets to be an actual starter not so much he's kind of struggled in that role but uh he's in the perfect role for the Blue Jays here so I like it I mean I don't love it by any means I think there's a lot of work still to do there but like I said before I think he's built the offense to where it needs to go and now he's going to take that next step and this team's headed in the right direction in the future uh possibly not this year but I think that they're doing it right and uh, things look bright in Toronto for sure in the future. So, uh, guys, let's switch over to uh, – Think about this real quick. Go ahead, buddy. So, you know, I know this is a Blue Jays podcast, but the Reds fan to me needs to, needs to come out a minute. This team is, is the exact opposite of the Reds, the 2020 Reds. If you put the 2020 Reds pitching staff and you flip-flopped the hitting with, uh, of the Reds with the Blue Jays, you'd have a World Series team. Yeah. I mean – Either way, I mean, those guys, <laughs> I mean, if, they're, if the Reds had the, the, the lineup that this, get, that this team had last year, the production, I don't know that they'd have lost 10 games. I mean, the way that pitching staff was. But anyway, that's neither here nor well, there. But. It occurs, actually, that's a great point. That's a great point. Because who had starters available this offseason? The Reds. Yeah. Yeah, they Why did. not cash in and try to get Sonny Gray? They have a great – the Blue Jays have an awesome farm system. Why yeah. not cash in and try to get Luis Castillo? That's exactly what, what this team is missing, and this lineup is as good as anyone's. That's why I'm saying if I'm a Blue Jays fan, I'm a little salty about this because, man, just a couple moves and you're there. I mean, you're a World Series contender. But right now, I mean, is this team going to make the – I know we're going to talk about this. Is, could this team make the playoffs? I think they could make it, possibly. <laughs> But with a couple pitchers, this team wins the division. And uh, that's just frustrating, very frustrating. So team strengths, I'm going to go with that offense. I think we've talked about it a lot here. Um, I think it's so cool, and I, I know we just talked about this a little bit, but BGO's boys out there running around now. Bichette's boys, a stud, and Guerrero's boys out there. Uh, just unbelievable as far as the family connections to baseball go. And then you got Guriel, obviously, who – um, <clears throat> has a brother in the league and everything too. So it's really cool. All the family connections that these guys have to baseball players who are in the show. Um, so it's really cool from that perspective that they're all young too. And these guys are up and coming Teoscar Hernandez kind of came out of nowhere was an absolute stud. So man, these guys are just loaded with some talent, man. This is a lot of fun to see. I'm going offense 100%. David, what do you think? Yeah, we've talked about it. It's the offense. There's no doubt about it. Uh, one of the best in the league. Turns. Yeah, I mean, it. I'm not going to say the offense. I'm just going to say it's the core nucleus of young talent that they have. And maybe that's what the, the, the GM's thinking here is that our window is a little bit bigger. And so maybe we don't need to go out right now and, and, and make a deal with, you know, maybe they've got some other plans in place to kind of, they do have a large window here. Now, I mean, obviously, we've seen that where maybe these guys don't pan out, but they all look very promising to me. Um, but I'm going to just say the core of uh, Bichette, Biggio, Vlad, and then, of course, those other guys that they have that you can throw in that mix. But that core nucleus of, of just solid guys, uh, to me, is the strength of the team. So team weakness, I'm going to go, like we just talked about, rotation. Not sold on it yet. I think Rod, Ross Atkins, GM focused on the offense more this off season, which I don't blame him. So it's getting there, but I'm going to say that, that like you said, David, 
I don't think that even like the Blue Jays are going to get the Red Sox batters out. That lineup is loaded in Boston. Uh, it's a great lineup. You know what? And man, to be honest with you, the Baltimore lineup's getting a little bit better too, man. Like they're they're starting to improve a little bit in Baltimore. I've been seeing some stuff on them in the spring, and obviously they've got a long ways to go. But man, there there's some guys on that team that are hitting the ball, and and uh, we'll talk about them in a few days, obviously. But Man, that, that team's headed upward a little bit and got some promise in the future there. And uh, so in this division, man, it's not going to compete with all the guys you got and all the teams that are just bashing in this in this uh, division. It's very hard. So it is a solid, uh, solid problem for them, no doubt. What do you think, David? <clears throat> yeah, the rotation is an issue that that as we talked about, the the Pearson injury really hurt uh, as well. Yeah, I'm not, and again, I'm not. I'm not sure. Is he out for the season? Do we know? I do not know. Maybe, Matt, if you can look that up, because I think you're going to agree it's the rotation, too. If, like, we, we can hear what happened to Pearson. Like, I, I didn't hear, you know, anything about that, to be honest with you, before we came on here. So, you, you kind of broke some news to me. But, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, Pearson, just so much promise and so much, you know, a lot that they kind of laid their their season on him to be the number two with with this team. and. Uh, if he goes down, man, they're in some even more of a more of some shambles here. But he's a stud, David, and he was like a fantasy pickup too there for uh, some oh, yeah. guys that were just when he came up, it was like automatically waiver wire to try to get him because you knew he was going to come up and pitch really well. And he's a K guy, so that helps in fantasy a lot too when you got a guy that's mowing him down, striking out a lot of people. So I don't know. Did you come up with anything, Matt? Yeah, I mean, from what I what I see here. Um, it's a it's a growing injury, um, oh. and it says here that they're not expecting it to be uh, anything major. It says very mild in nature, but they they are saying that he's probably not going to make the opening day roster. Um, but other than that, it just seems like to me they're just they're, he's going to kind of like a day to day type schedule here, so it doesn't seem too that's, serious to me. That's good news for them. I mean, he Pearson will help them, and and obviously that just puts another good arm back in the bullpen stripling or whoever it is uh throws them in the bullpen so i i, I hate it worse now that they got if, if they do get pearson back but i think the rotation is definitely their weakness yeah no doubt so position battles i'll go ahead and kick it off here i'm gonna go with the end of that rotation with some fights going on there a little bit with stripling uh and chatwood for the back end there but you know stripling is not a bad starter but i don't know if he can stick there and they may see chatwood starting to Kind of get some starts there as we were talking about a little bit here. Um, so one of the things, though, here's a, here's some pretty cool stats here, though. I, I want I want to give you guys this. So kind of pay attention just a little bit here. These are career numbers of two pitchers. Okay, the first guy we'll call him Guy A. Seventy six wins, sixty seven losses. Seventy six and sixty seven with a three eighty three ERA. 931 Ks and 1,145 innings. Get player B, 75 wins, 64 losses, 390 career ERA, 1,279 Ks and 1,190 pit, uh, innings pitched. Pretty, pretty even, right? I mean, any idea which one you would take on those two? I mean, it's very, I mean, I don't know if I've kind of, Well, uh, all things being equal, I'll take the guy with the case probably. Uh, although the other guy had a little bit lower ERA, I'd probably take the guy with the case. Yeah, it's pretty pretty even there. So guy A is Tanner Roark, and guy B is Trevor Bauer. So that's the career right there. And I'm not by any means saying that Tan I'd take Tanner Roark over Trevor Bauer. I'm not saying that. But the body career, man. Tanner Roark deserves a little bit of credit here. You know, I know he's not an ace. Uh, he's a three, four guy in your rotation. Um, he's somebody that, you know, has been pretty solid for the most part. He's had a couple up and down years. Um, so, I mean, it's just crazy to think that, you know, Tanner Roark's making no money and Trevor Bauer is making more money than anybody in the world. And they got the same career stats. I know, you know, last year, obviously Bauer just mowed him down dominating, but it just kind of goes to show you sometimes that, if you catch a year or two where you just dominate, man, you will cash out. And Tanner's oh, wow. never done that, and that's the problem, I think, there. But consistently, man, these two are pretty much the same pitcher uh, with a little more Ks given to Bauer over their careers. So it's kind of crazy to see that 
uh, and go from that. And one more thing I wanted to mention real quick, give Tanner a little love. Uh, Tanner and Dylan were brothers and won a state title together here in Illinois. Absolute studs. Both of them pitched. I actually thought Dylan was a better player than Tanner, and I was wrong about that. Um, we played against them. Our high school played against them. They were in our conference. And uh, he was a few – they were both a few years uh, younger than us, obviously. But, um, man, those guys used to just hit absolute bombs at their field. So they hit one one morning on a Saturday. Uh, I think it was Dylan that hit it. Uh, these two older – this older couple was sitting there eating breakfast, and one of the balls went right through their window that they hit. And so, <laughs> so it scared them to death. And uh, they have a giant net over left field now because of uh, Tanner and Dylan hitting bombs out of that high school field. Now it's like right in the middle of the neighborhood. So uh, those guys were both studs. Like I said, they won a state title here, which as we talked about yesterday, David is very hard to do. Uh, so when you got those two guys, they mowed them down and uh, big kudos to them home homegrown guys that uh, completely just uh, took it in high school for sure. Really cool story there. So David, what do you got for position battle? Well, now they got a position battle in the bullpen, the, the closer. I don't know if they're going to do closer by committee or, or how they're going to do that, you know, matchups. Uh, right now it looks like uh, Romano would probably be the leading guy there. He, he, of those guys, I don't have in front of me how many saves he had last year, but I think he had the most of the guys left over. But 2-1 and one with a 123 uh, last year. You also have Dolis back there who had a 150 ERA last year. And then, like I said, you can mix and match uh, with uh, Chatwood and some of those other guys. So. I, th I think they'll be able to fill that closer role, but, um, I, you know, it'll be interesting to see who comes out ahead on that. Matt, what do you got? Yeah, that's the same thing I was thinking, you know. Um, I watched your uh, your Braves podcast today, and uh, Steve Shelton was talking about if you don't have a, a stud closer, if you've got two, if you kind of got the, the closer by committee, you don't have one. I'm going to have to disagree with that, honestly. I, I don't think that that's the case. I mean, if you look across the league, I didn't realize until today when we started looking at our fantasy ranking stuff, man, there's not any shutdown closers. I mean, you've got one or two, and that's it. I mean, when you're talking about Russell Iglesias as the top a top five closer, yeah. and, you know, and I'm a Reds fan, and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, honestly, there's just not that that's many true. guys out there that, that come in now and shut the door. Right. Um, so – yeah, I mean, with, with the combination of guys that they have, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see who gets the ball there in the ninth inning. But, you know, those things um, tend to play themselves out, whoever kind of gets the hot hand or some of the, sometimes one of those guys comes out and you've seen it happen many times where you'll get a guy going a streak and close out nine or ten games and he gets the nod and the next thing you know, he's a world-class, you know, closer. So maybe that's the situation here. I don't know. But but that's definitely where the uh, the battle is to me. I think everything else is pretty much sewn up. So I'll change your comment right Go there. Ahead, turns out, I, I, I do think that the, the days of one single guy being the closer, I think that's pretty much over or getting close to being over, except for those super elite guys. Uh, you know, the Rays have proven it. Mixing and matching works. And uh, so I have to agree with you there. So we'll transition to the prospects now. And on the offense, I think we all agree that Danny Jansen is the catcher that is he's kind of the weak leak offensively. So Gabriel Moreno is a prospect in their system here. He's 5'11", 160. Boy, is that a beanpole right there. 160-pound catcher. Good grief. He's going to fly away. <laughs> Good Lord. So right-handed uh, both ways. He's a catcher and a DH. I don't know how you become a DH when you're um, going through the system, but they got him listening at those two spots. Career 294 hitter in the minors. 16 bombs, 105 ribbies, 172 hits in 154 games in his career, which is obviously really good. He's 21 years old. Uh, the Blue Jays need a stud catcher. You know, they've got pretty much every other offensive position just locked down. Uh, so perhaps this is the guy, man. He's coming up. He's got a 2022 ERA. So, you know, Jansen's kind of getting a little bit of a, you know, he's kind of up on the, in the, in the air as far as his future goes here. So, if, uh, if Gabriel can step up here this year, uh, playing a full season of minor league ball, I think he can contend for the spot next year from what I've been reading. So he seems a little legit from all the video I've been seeing. Um, he's going to be really good. So got him breathing down his neck a little bit. So that's who I had. David, what do you got? Wait, I hope I'm going to still turn to thunder right here, I bet. 
I'm going to talk about Alec Manoa, WVU, former West Virginia player. I don't get to talk too much about West Virginia players. <laughs> this guy's the real deal, uh, DJ. He's the real deal. You better watch out for this guy. Matter of fact, I would love to see him this year. He's dominated in the spring, absolutely dominated. Seven innings, 15 Ks uh, this spring. I tell you who he reminds me of. He reminds me exactly of Lance Lynn. He's a big 6'6", 260-pound guy that's just going to come in there and bring the heat. A little violent on the delivery, which worries you a little bit. But fastball slider guy, watch out for Alec Manoa. Matt, who do you got? Yeah, he stole my thunder for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was praying DJ would let me go first because I didn't have anybody else either. Well, so just to add to that, so I I don't know much about him honestly, except for the fact that he's a WVU guy. But I did read up a little bit today that said that he had uh, developed a, a new changeup over the uh, the off season, and so apparently that's being successful for him in spring training. So it would be cool to see this guy get a shot in the bigs. Uh, but, but I'll talk about their their uh, 2020 top draft pick, Austin Martin. Uh, they've got him slotted as a third base or outfield type player. Um, and I don't know much about him, but I do know that he signed for like the club record of $7 million in the offseason. Um, so it should be interesting when you I think when you when you put that much money or have that big of an investment in a guy, one for the player, the pressure that they may feel to, to develop, to, to you know, to produce. And then second, you know, as, as an organization, you've got so much invested in somebody like that. You kind of feel like you have to, you know, push them along or advance them up. From what I'm reading, though, he's uh, he's very advanced and they're 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 going to plan on starting him out at, at class. They advance. So um, it will be interesting to see, because as you look at this team, obviously, all these guys probably aren't going to stick around forever. But I mean, really, within the next two to three years you know, this lineup should be pretty well established. So maybe this guy's trade bait or maybe one of the guys on the roster is trade bait. But um, that's, that's a guy that I would kind of pinpoint as a guy that he's listed as their, as their top prospect over – well, Pearson is listed as a prospect still, but he played last year. So I'm going to go with uh, Austin Martin here. Nice. I love this portion of the program, man, because I get to learn more about some guys coming up, and we do a good job of that. It gives you – more perspective of what's coming in the future, man. The Blue Jays are spending some money, boys. They really are, and it's pretty cool to hear that they're spending that much on on prospects too. Very cool thing. So, uh, favorite memory? I'll go ahead and start here. It's got to be Joe Carter hitting the walk off over the uh, Mitch Williams in the in the 1993 World Series. I remember, you know, watching it with my grandpa, which kind of made that special to me. Uh, we were I was at his house when this happened, uh, and my grandpa. My grandpa, man, I just got to kind of tell you, this is this is kind of funny. He would sit in the kitchen and he, you know, he'd be eating and he had one little TV in the kitchen where he could look at with his left eye. And then on his right eye, he had the uh, the TV in the living room. So he would watch two things at one time, sitting in the chair in the kitchen. <laughs> and man, he was watching the World Series in here and he's watching a show in the other room, you know, and that just he just that's how he was that's who he was he you know he loved to eat food and watch tv and watch baseball and all that so just a lot of great memories there I was obviously just became a teenager then and uh just a lot of good memories and uh that team was awesome Robbie Alomar Ricky Henderson Joe Carter Paul Molitor Dave Stewart Jack Morris Danny Cox and Pat Hennigan holy cow like you got some hall of famers there obviously you got some borderline Hall of Famers there. That 92-93 Blue Jays were just loaded and just completely awesome. So that's my favorite memory. David, what do you got, buddy? Well, my favorite Blue Jays memory really doesn't involve the Blue Jays. So when I think the Blue Jays, this is honest to God truth, I think of about 1992, maybe 91, being in Matt Kearns' backyard. He was always the Blue Jays, and I was always the Yankees. We went so far as to making a lineup card in the whole nine the whole nine yards. And back then, the Yankees were terrible. And the Blue Jays obviously were pretty good. But when I think of the Blue I thought I actually sat down and thought about this today. What could I say about the Blue Jays? It's like, man, when I think Blue Jays, I think Whipple Ball in Kearns' <laughs> backyard. That's, that's what I think of. So that's, that's my favorite memory of the Blue Jays. Yep. That's awesome. Very cool, man. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I mean, 
I'm with David. I mean, when he said that, I was, I mean, that's one of the first things. The second thing that comes to my mind is just baseball cards. That's kind of how I picked the Blue Jays was, I, you know, baseball cards and I like the team and it, their color scheme. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to pick the Blue Jays. But I guess it was one of those things that worked out because like you just said, man, and that stretch from say early, late eighties to early nineties, man, they had a lot of good players come through there. And even yeah, later on, you know, they even had Roger Clemens and, you know, that, that class with Vernon Wells and Carlos Delgado. And then with Bautista, I mean, they've had a lot of good players come through there. So, but for me, it, it's just, you know, like I said, the last few years, obviously I'm a Reds fan. This team right here gets me excited again to, to follow the Blue Jays. But when it comes to, to favorite memories, it has to go back to the wiffle ball games that we played <laughs> and then and then baseball card collecting to me. So I got to ask you guys on the, on the wiffle ball games, how many more, how many more players did you have besides you two playing those games in the backyard? One. And it was a girl. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so it was one on one. That's how we played one on one. Listen, I can vividly remember this. I hit one home run in our wiffle ball league. They had a there's a fence out there, like a driveway and then a fence. And you know who hit it? I can still remember it to this day. Alvaro Espinosa, Yankee <laughs> shortstop, hit my only home run because we went right down the lineup. Who was batting in the whole nine yards? That's who hit my home run in the Matt Kearns wiffle ball league. Matt, what was your best pitch in wiffle ball? How'd you get him out all the time? What'd you throw, man? I kind of had this weird, I don't know, like, I don't want to say sidearm delivery, but like, I don't know. Thinking about it now, it's just like, because I didn't play baseball. I never played a day of baseball. My my experience was is wiffle ball. And like, you know, uh, obviously I'm a little bit older than David. So even back then, you know, it's it, it wasn't. It's not like it's nothing now, but I think about, man, he's a college pitcher, and, you know, like I used to wear him out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not hard to do. <laughs> I know but, David's yeah. repertoire. He, he could throw about 15 different pitches, so I just want to know what yours was, man. That's pretty cool, man. Just throw the sidearm and get him out, man. Jam him so to this, death. This is the true story. This has nothing to do with the Blue Jays. This has nothing to do with anything except for this is just a memory I have of sore. So – he got me into church softball. I'm guessing this has probably been 10 years ago, at least now. And so like, you know, he's, you know, 10 years younger. So now you got to think he's, you know, he's 30, young, late twenties. And so he's like, you want to throw? And I'm like, yeah, we can throw. So he wants, he's playing in this, this men's, I guess, adult league baseball league. And he's like, do you mind catching for me? And I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah, why not? You know? So I like, again, Never played baseball. Like, I'm pretty athletic, you know, no big deal. I'm thinking, you know. So, he gets in there, he starts throwing me some fastballs, and I'm like, dang, man, I've never seen a ball, like, move like that. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's like, well, I'm going to throw a few curveballs. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Son, I'm telling you, he threw one, and I'm not lying to you. It nicked my glove, hit me square in the head, and went up in the air about 30 feet. <laughs> he thought he was <laughs> like, okay. said, Dude, are you all right? <laughs> And I'm like laughing because it, I don't know what happened, but it, like it didn't hurt. It just like skimmed my glove and shot right off my head. It was hilarious. But <laughs> I remember it scared the crap out of me. It absolutely scared the crap out of me. <laughs> oh, I oh, should have had him throw that. You should have thrown that dirty knuckleball at him. See what he would do with that. He did, he did throw that. That's what I'm saying. Like I hadn't never played baseball, so I'm just used to like everything's coming at you straight. And then you know he's throwing at me, and I'm like, well, where'd that? How did that ball move like that? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. And, and it's kind of funny when we were kids, like, like you were talking about, Matt, like some of the things that trigger you into fandom of a player or a team. Yeah. It's just something minor most of the time, to be honest with you. I mean, obviously, since, you know, if you live in the city, you're going to jump on that team. But, you know, like certain things kind of trigger us when we were kids. And, like, we, it just sticks with us the rest of our life. And it's something very small most of the time, which makes it, even cooler to think that like like you were saying opening a pack of cards and you get blue jays and you're like man this is awesome i like the logo or i like the colors or and then it kind of sticks with you man it's it's really cool it's something i love about the game baseball just just it's just awesome in general but that kind of stuff lives with you forever so the stadium guys rogers center from 1989 uh to current um <laughs> i don't know man i'm <laughs> just <laughs> I'm just not sold on this bad boy. I, I I don't get it. I don't I don't know if I want to get a I don't know if I want to go through the trouble of crossing the border to go. I have to. 
but <laughs> not overly excited. You're about eight miles from there anyway, aren't you? Right? You're like yes. right up on the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> so DJ, one cool thing about this stadium that, that that I think would be really awesome. So they got the hotel out in center field. I think they still have it, right? Yeah. Um, I think that that would be pretty cool if you could uh, get a hotel room up there or whatever and watch the game from your room. That would be pretty sweet. But other than that, uh, I do. I am thankful that they changed the turf there. Remember that turf was a real oh. problem for a lot of people. A lot of people didn't want to play there because of it. So, uh, but other than that, I don't get the sky dome either. Have you, have, you ever, I'm sorry. have you ever been met? No, I never have. Um, I do know some friends that went probably oh, 25 years ago when it was, you know, a newer stadium and they said it was really awesome. They knew back then, really? when it was new, but but no, I never went. Wow, that's something else. Surprise us, DJ. Yeah, I, I mean. You never know. I mean, until you go and experience it yourself. That's another thing, too, is sometimes the uh, camera work doesn't do everything justice. So I'm going to kick us off with trivia here. I'm going to let you both chime in on this one. The top 10 career home runs in a Blue Jays uniform. Go. Delgado. Oh, yep. Number one. Delgado. <laughs> Batista. Two. Vernon yes, Wells. Please. Yeah. Or Alex yeah, Rios. Barfield. Barfield down there. There you go. Rios is not. Ooh. Uh, was Joe Carter there long enough to be on the you list? Got it. Number five. Uh, let's see here. I know there's somebody real obvious that we're missing. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. Kelly Gruber. Ooh, that is a good, good pick, but he is not on there. Kelly Gruber. He's got to be the Alomar. Alomar is not on there. Probably wasn't there long enough, but that's a good pick. Raul too. Mondesi. Ooh, not Raul Mondesi. Nope. Oh, who's uh, that? What was it? Oh, there's an outfitter I was thinking of, but. They're all in our lifetime, so th this is kind of a – they're all in our lifetime. Like, we've been watching – we've seen all these players. Josh Donaldson. Don, man, that, he's got to be up there too, but he's not on the list. Oh, I thought for sure he'd be there. Uh, let's see here. Mm. Give us some hints. So, the one guy is currently a – free agent who played with the team. Edwin last Encarnacion. Uh, I, I, knew we were, I knew there was one obvious, but that's an obvious one right there. He's, number, he's number three. The, the – let me make sure I say this one correctly. Yeah, I'm going to say this correctly. This guy, and during his career, not with the Blue Jays, but this guy during his career was traded for Sammy Sosa. George Bell. You got it. Um. <laughs> The 80s catcher for the Blue Jays. 80s catcher? Mm, 80s catcher. Was Lance tough. Plant? No. What is it? It's a tough one. But you know, I know you've heard of him. Yeah, I when you when we started this list, I was thinking of a catcher, but I can't think of his name. Ernie Witt. Ernie Witt. Yeah, man. I remember Ernie Witt. I can't believe Adam Lind is number nine. I don't think anybody would get that. I had no clue Adam Lind he was. had a couple really, list. really good years with him. He, he must have put – Matt, if I'm not mistaken, he must have, like, had two or three years where he just mashed, like you said, to get on that list. Yeah, I, I think he had two or three years of over 40 home runs or something like that. Oh, wow. And then number eight was Lloyd Mosby. <laughs> what got that one? Lloyd. <laughs> All right, David, what's your trivia, buddy? My trivia has to do with home runs as well. The first Blue Jay to lead the league in home runs, it happened in 1986. Who was it? Ooh. You know, there's another Blue Jay that I, that I can't believe didn't make that list. That's Fred McGriff. Yeah. Not there quite long enough, I guess. Must have had a lot with the Braves. That's a good but point, though. I'm going to say your the, the answer to your question is George Bell. 
I'm going to go with Bell as well. Boy, Jesse Barfield. Y'all should have been listening. Oh. I gave it away. I had to bring him up because he was on those vaunted 90s teams that competed in Kearns' backyard. He was the cleanup <laughs> hitter. <laughs> he hit right after Mel Hall. Yeah. Funny story there, but it, I can't I can't talk about that, right, Kearns? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. Matt, you got Hi. a trivia question? No, I, again, I've dropped the ball on the trivia questions. It's all good, but man, yeah, stinking. I can't believe I missed that one. That those '86 teams for every team, I could tell you pretty much the entire roster for '86 teams. That's kind of like the year I came into baseball, so it's pretty special to me. And I could tell you like the roster for every team that year. Plus, RBI baseball was an '86 game, so you oh, see yeah. all those rosters, and they're all from the '86 teams. So it made it a lot easier to remember all those guys that were in there. So it's prediction time, guys. Prediction for the Blue Jays. Here we go. I'm going to kick this one off with Matt. I want to hear his perspective first on what he thinks is going to happen with the Blue Jays this year. All right. Well, so like David said, to start this podcast, they made a step forward this year. I think they're going to take another step. I'm going to pick them to finish second in the division. I, I believe that lineup oh. is going to be too potent. I know that the pitching is questionable and it's going to be their weakness, but I honestly feel like with the guys that they have in place offensively that you're going to see a lot of nine to seven ball games that they're going to come out on top of. And if the bullpen is solid, then, uh, then, then, you know, I think they're going to be competing for a, for a playoff spot, obviously, but I'm, I'm going to, I've got them second. Wow. So you put them in second. So you got to let me know then since they're in second, you got to, you got to make this uh, official. Are they going to make the playoffs? I mean, a second place team can. So what are you thinking on that? Are you going yes or no on that? Yeah, I think they will. If they, if they finish second in division, I'll put them in the playoffs. Okay. Very cool. Wow. I like that. That's interesting. I don't, you know, I can't blame you. What do you think, David? I'll tell you, I really struggle with this all day, (laughs) all day long. I kept going back and forth, but you know, on the on the radio when I came home, I heard that Nick Anderson's out for the season with Tampa Bay. Oh my gosh! I'm just drafted him. <laughs> yeah, out for the out for the season. So I'm going to go with the Blue Jays in second place. Woo! Yep. And I'm really? Gonna say that they are going to miss the playoffs. Oh, the AL East will only have one playoff team this year. Pretty sure I know who he's going to go on now, but. I just don't think, I just don't think that they have enough pitching. I just, I can't get past that pitching staff. And even when I compare it to the Rays, even when I compare it to the Rays, there's not that much difference between the two. So, and yeah, think about that. The Rays got, they got Rich Hilder running out there and Chris Archer. I trust those guys as much as I trust Robbie Ray. I'm not kidding. But think about this. So we we talked about this a little bit. Let's say that the Reds are out of it and we get to the all-star break and they say, you want Sonny Gray? All right. Give us a couple of your prospects. Yeah. You put that guy on that team. That's all it's going to take. That's all it's going to take. I 100% so to me, agree with you. To me, I feel like this team, like I said originally, this team reminds me so much of that Kansas City team. I just feel like they're just – they're like a piece or two away from, from, from taking that step to the, to the world series. So yeah, I, it's, it's a prediction. I don't know what's going to happen obviously with the reds. And I hope that they don't, that they are successful, that they don't have to sell off some parts, but man, if, if they're, if they're not, and they wouldn't, you know, that's a perfect match for, for, you know, a team to, to try to get some prospects from would be the blue Jays. So David, what do you got, I'm, DJ? I'm, Man, David, I'm you got my head spinning here a little bit. You got one AL East team making the playoffs. So that means you got three teams from one of the divisions making the playoffs here. And you're not putting the Rays or the Blue Jays in the playoffs. Wow. Pretty tough. And listen, Man. it would not surprise me at all if the Blue Jays made the made the playoffs, but I think there's there could be three teams out of that central DJ. There's definitely going to be two. There's definitely <laughs> oh. going to be two. I'm just not buying that, but okay. I'm, that. Go I'm gonna go third place. 
We, we finally disagreed on a position here a little bit in the AL East. I'm not putting them ahead of the two monsters. No playoffs. Not there yet with the pitching, but I do agree with you both. They are one or two. I, I say two stud starters away from being a legit World Series contender. They're that close. Like, they get a couple more solid pitchers in here. They're contenders for the whole deal. They're that close. But I'm just a little – little off with the other two teams that are in this division I think are just a little bit better than them I still think that uh, but they can make some moves at the deadline and I would not be surprised if they took off so uh, that one could bite me in the butt picking them third but I just don't see it right now as far as them landing there so any guys guys got any shout outs for any Blue Jays fans that you know uh, definitely we did, didn't did not have any college teammates so you guys know any Blue Jays fans I have no Blue Jays fans that I know either, so nothing. got nothing. All right, well, guys, this was a good one. Uh, the Blue Jays are a very interesting team, a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome to check them out in 2021 here to watch them play. So, Matt, thank you so much for joining us tonight, buddy. It's always great to have you. Uh, your perspective on uh, everything Blue Jays here is really cool. It's the first time you've done the Blue Jays with us, so that's pretty awesome, man. And uh, David, as always, buddy, it's been a pleasure, man. And uh, all you fans out there, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Frenemies. We appreciate it and give us some views. Thanks, guys. Have a great night.